Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. As Europe settles in for an even deeper recession, in many countries of Europe, in Greece, now of course Cyprus, and Spain, and Portugal, and we'll see it soon, probably in other countries, even France, a big sale is on. Some people have called it a fire sale. And what are they selling? Public assets in order to pay off their debts. Now joining us to talk about all of this is Nick Buxton. He's communication manager for Transnational Institute, which, prov which provides analysis for movements working for social and environmental change. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Hi, Paul. Thanks for inviting me. So how big or wide scale is this fire sale, as you're calling it? And why is it happening? It's very wide, widespread. We've been looking at some of the um, memorandums of agreement that are signed by the European Commission and the European Central Bank with each of the countries as it's come forward to, uh, for, for issues with their debt uh, to get loans from, from the European Central Bank. And each of them have had to sign these memorandums of, under, of agreement with the European Commission. And when we've looked at the details of those agreements, it's not just about making cuts that we most famously hear about. Almost in every agreement, there is a demand for privatization of key national assets and key public services. And this is not just happening in countries that we, we all know are at the epicenter of the crisis, such as Greece and Portugal. But many of the countries across Europe are now using this as a way of pushing for it. Most notably, the UK, uh, which was a pioneer of privatization, is really pushing through another, uh, another wave of privatization, particularly now affecting the National Health Service. Uh, so so there's, uh, the economist Paul Krugman perhaps has put this best, that the crisis austerity is not about solving the crisis, it's about using the crisis. And that's what our report tried to look at, how the crisis has been used to push uh, for privatization. A group of unions and other organizations sent a letter to Commissioner Wren, a European commissioner, and asking him for their position on this issue of privatization. Here's, here's what Wren wrote back to them. As you know, the privatization of public companies contributes to the reduction of public debt, as well as to the reduction of subsidies, other transfers of state guarantees to state-owned enterprises. It also has the potential of increasing the efficiency of companies and, by extension, the competitiveness of the economy as a whole, while attracting foreign direct investment. So the commissioner seems to be saying this isn't just about dealing with uh, bank debts or state debts uh, or the financial crisis. This is kind of a more overarching objective of theirs, and, and maybe this lends some credibility to taking advantage of the crisis. In other words, crisis or no crisis, they want more privatization. Yeah, and, and actually by itself, that's rather shocking, because if you look at the European Treaty, it says that the European Commission remains neutral on whether companies and enterprises are in public or private hands. Whereas if you read that letter, it's very clear that they're not at all neutral and they're not even pretending to be neutral on this, on this key issue. Um, and so it's quite clearly an agenda, a very clearly marked out and publicly spoken agenda to privatize and, and deregulate. It's kind of ironic given it's privately owned banks that have created, the, have triggered this whole crisis. Exactly, and it, it still comes back to that argument that is, is, is continues the myth that this was a crisis created by public debt. Uh, whereas if you look at all the f figures and the stats, the debt levels were very low, and they, they actually still remain well below US levels even now across Europe uh, until, until you had the banking crisis. And it was only as the bailout of the banks, and it was 4.5 trillion euros went to bail out the banks from EU money. That's aside from all the US federal money that went in to bail out European banks. All, all that money was what created the debt crisis. And yet we're still getting the argument very much that this is a problem of public debt and public spending. So give us some examples of, of the kind, the scale and types of privatization, privatizations that are taking place or are planned to take place? Well, perhaps the largest is, is Italy, where they're expecting projecting up to 570 billion euros of, of money coming from sales, largely of huge amounts of uh, heritage and state national assets being, being sold off, but also energy, transport. In most of the sectors you're talking about, water is almost universally tackled, uh, despite the huge controversy that there's been for many decades now about water privatization, uh, but also energy, transport, uh, water, electricity, health, um, and, and a whole group of, of other services and any kind of national companies like telecommunication companies, airlines, uh, bus companies, and so on. So it's, it's right across the whole sector. Um, I think Greece is obviously where you're seeing some of the most extensive privatization 
um, being pushed through. Yeah, they're planning, I think they're planning to sell the, the two biggest ports in Greece. The two biggest ports in Greece, it's their main energy uh, companies. Uh, the most controversial ones at the moment are being fought around water in Thessaloniki in Athens, uh, where they're pushing those things through. And it, it's also happening in, um, and perhaps one of the most controversial cases is just to show how this is really an anti-democratic uh, decision by the European Union is Italy. In Italy in 2011, June 2011, there was a massive referendum uh, of the Italian population. 95% of those who voted in the referendum voted against the privatization of water and public services. And what's shocking is that just three months later in August, the European Commission writes to the Italian government saying, you need to liberalize and privatize these pu public services, completely ignoring Italian public opinion uh, and really putting a, um, a sham on, on the ar argument that they're representing a democratic uh, opinion. And it was really an an anti-democratic sentiment. And it was only as a result of huge public pressure that the Italian government didn't cave in. And finally, it was the Constitutional Court in, in last year who, who said that actually it was illegal under the Constitution because of the public opinion for the Italian government to proceed with privatization. So this is something that's, that's not been uh, uh, accepted by a large amount of European people. So it's something that's been resisted very actively. Well, I guess it's one of the sectors that's left where capital can go. I mean, there's, there's, there's so little place that in terms of the productive economy that you can invest that where the, the space isn't already taken up. Plus, purchasing power is not really growing. Yeah. So, so where's capital going to go? It's either going to go into these derivatives and speculative areas where they can kind of people with money can gamble against each other, or you can pry open these public resources with almost guaranteed markets. I mean, if you control a city's yeah. water supply, you know you're going to sell water. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's almost a guaranteed um, uh, ability for corporations to profit. Uh, well, I think I think that's very much at the core of it because it's not about raising a lot of money. It's interesting. Greece was projected initially to raise 50 billion euros through its sales. They've now revised that down to 25 billion. That doesn't mean less has been sold off, but they're now expecting much less money to come in because corporations know that Greece is in crisis. They're able to get assets at very cheap prices, and they're not going to pay more than they have to. So it's it's we're not talking about a lot of money, but it's what they do then is have a, a guaranteed income stream. Um, and we see that very clearly with privatization that's happened in places like in the UK, because um, if, if it's about reducing state money, then why is it that the UK government um, more than 10 years, 15 years after railway privatization is still shelling out $4 billion or 3 billion euros to private railway companies? It's, it's because those state subsidies continue, but rather than being invested in public services, it's, it's going towards shareholders and a few corporate executives. And what you see in the UK and, and many privatized services across Europe is some of the highest prices and much higher than the public, than public services that remain in public hands. Uh, so the money, the state money is still being given to these companies to survive supposedly, but is now being uh, funded towards shareholders and corporate uh, bonuses rather than them being invested in public services. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a crazy mentality. They, they seem to have, they being the people that are driving this kind of agenda, they seem to have this faith that it's, you know, only a matter of time till the economy, economy comes back and everything will be growing again and then we'll own all these great positions. Where before their eyes, they're driving Europe into a deeper and deeper decade or decades long recession. I think there's a lot of contradictions going on here. I think um, that certainly this, this drive to deregulate and privatize, which we know is what led to the financial crisis and to the European crisis, um, now being used as supposedly a solution to it is, is, in itself, is in itself crazy. But it's very much part of an agenda that's been driven forward in Europe, and particularly within the European Union since the Lisbon Treaty uh, a few years ago. It's been a whole bunch of European measures. So this is really a continuation but we're seeing that that policy is, and it's, it's a policy that's pushed by some of the biggest business groups. What's interesting is the European Commission positions are very close to that of Business Europe, which is the main, one of the biggest lobbying groups. And yet it is leading to this recession. It's, it's, it's lead, deepening it. It's not resolving the crisis. 
uh, and it's 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 likely in the end to affect corporate profits either either way. But it seems that there's a ideology here that we cannot let go of, and um, regardless of its costs. And unfortunately, its costs are not primarily economic at this point. It's social, and we're having some really disturbing um, pictures now unfolding in in Europe. What, what, as part of our report, we looked at the unemployment figures and youth unemployment in, in nearly all of these crisis countries uh, that are in, going through the debt crisis most severely are now reaching 50%. That's one in two young people under 25 unemployed. And the long-term costs of that um, are, are hard to judge, but are likely to be very severe. And a, lar a large proportion of those young unemployed people are people that have actually graduated from university. It's not like undereducated or underskilled no, or something. Exactly. These are actually fair, skilled and educated people are unemployed. And that's going to have very long-term costs, and, that's, and those are, which are quite disturbing, and uh, let alone all the other things that have been put aside, such as necessary needs for investment in, 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 energy, in green energy and in environmental uh, conservation and so on. So there's, there's, there's going to be long, very serious long-term costs of this. This isn't something that's just about corporate profits. It's also about the long-term future for many Europeans. Right. Okay. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.